Well-being and happiness are not universal concepts, but socially constructed across different cultures. Throughout this presentation, we'll be showcasing how concepts of well-being and happiness differ across many cultures. From there on, we will be able to understand how stakeholders, such as firms and health makers, are able to take this information and implement it within a cultural perspective. Trump and I's achievement versus description dimension can be summarised by asking, do we prove ourselves to get status or is it given to us? In an achievement culture, you earn status through knowledge or skill. Job titles are earned and reflect this knowledge and skill. Anyone can challenge a decision if they have a logical argument. Examples of achievement cultures include the US, the UK and Germany. In an description culture, you are given status based on who you are. This could be because of your social status, your education, or your age. You earn respect in these cultures because of your commitment to the organisation, not your abilities. A decision will only be challenged by someone with higher authority. Examples of ascription in cultures include Japan, Italy, and France. People associate status with happiness, as they perceive their status as the key to happiness. Research constantly shows that the more money people have, the more likely they are to report being satisfied with their lives. And this makes sense. Money buys you things that make life easier and more satisfying. The easier your life, the happier you tend to be. In regards to happiness, it's imperative that we look at Schwartz's theory of basic values. Hedonism is an ethical theory whereby happiness and pleasure are said to be the highest aim of human life. Happiness is fulfilled in the form of self-indulgence and pleasure and is independent from culture to culture. Throughout United Arab Emirate cultures such as Saudi Arabia and Dubai, luxury goods and expenses are deemed as the highest form of pleasure. This is due to a culture that is rewarded and incentivized on monetary value. Diana Howards and Emin state that those with money can enjoy fun and pleasurable experiences, as well as stating that in a review of 30 studies found that every single study, richer people reported higher average levels of happiness than poorer people. Thus, there is extensive evidence for the connection between money and subjective well-being. However, in countries such as Lebanon, where luxury and monetary goods are not incentivized, hedonism appears differently. Pleasure-seeking experiences are shared with large family members and are often more traditional and simplistic in nature. As a whole, it is clear that hedonism, despite how each culture interprets the term, does overall contribute to happiness. Maslow's hierarchy of needs can cover two aspects of well-being, psychological and physical. The physical side of well-being is based around the lower, more basic levels of Maslow's pyramid, and the higher levels, like love and belonging and self-actualization, are physiological. Analyzing well-being on a physical side of things requires looking at things like food, water and security. These are far easier to identify and determine the direct link to well-being. As across all cultures, these things need to be addressed and cared for to improve human well-being. Basic levels are not culturally specific. Because of this, it can be said that the higher psychological needs are more closely related to cultural specific well-being, as the US National Library of Health study highlights. The study was titled Subjective and Objective Hierarchy in their Relation to Psychological Wellbeing, a US-Japan comparison. The results state that in the Western context, people with higher objective social status have better psychological wellbeing. They typically control more resources and encounter fewer financial, social and psychological stresses. In addition, higher rank offers greater opportunities for self-realisation and self-development. In the Eastern context, objective hierarchies have even more legitimacy and positive resonance than they do in the West and are used to organise a wide array of everyday activities. People are aware of, well aware of their place in these hierarchies and are more comfortable with hierarchical social relations than Americans. Additionally, the study concluded that well-being through self-assessment in Japan is more about how do others feel about me, whereas in the US it is much more dependent on personal feelings. Applying this to Maslow's framework, the belongingness and love needs would have greater effect on well-being in Japan than in the US, where instead the greater effect would come from esteem needs. The two-factor theory by Frederick Herzberg outlines that improving the hygiene factors decreases job dissatisfaction while improving the motivator factors increases job satisfaction. Job dissatisfaction and satisfaction is important to the well-being of workers. Why does this matter? The average person spends more than half of their time awake each day working. Hence, working conditions are crucial in employee well-being. Conditions at work impact individuals' personal lives 
including eating, sleeping, and the development of relationships, ultimately affecting the workers' physical and mental health. A journal article from the U.S. National Library of Medicine, National Institute of Health, conducted a 10,000 participation survey that analyzed socio-demographic and working condition variables that found workers' well-being was significantly higher when they were satisfied with their working conditions, when their actual working hours were the same as their anticipated working hours, and when their employment was stable. Poor working conditions, such as individuals with, which work in sweatshops in Bangladesh that are exploited by unreasonable hours, unfair wages, extreme heat, and bad air quality, have an extremely low well-being. When working conditions improve, so will the well-being of the worker. This is shown through Herzberg's model as improving the hygiene factors decreases job dissatisfaction, while improving the motivator factors increases job satisfaction. Collectivism versus individualism on happiness. Gert Hosford's cultural dimension of collectivism versus individualism relates to how happiness is socially constructed. Fundamentally, this dimension addresses the degree of interdependence a society maintains among its members and how individuals define their self-image. In collectivist cultures, happiness is achieved through social means such as social involvement and, particip and participation, through one's participation in a community or society. Monson Joshinlu, a psychologist at Kim Young University found that collectivist countries regard community and tradition as happiness. This is in contrast to individualistic cultures where happiness and life satisfaction focuses on the in individual. Self-esteem is a key indicator whether it is the need to satisfy personal desires. Monson Josh Shan Lu found that happiness in individualistic cultures tend to be found through internal efforts and pleasure seeking. A study conducted by Aaron Jardin, a senior lecturer at Auckland University, found that people who associate happiness with pleasure seeking in individualistic cultures tend to be happier than people with the same association in collectivist cultures. This shows that happiness has been socially constructed as individualistic and collective cultures have a different understanding and meaning of happiness. As the world becomes increasingly integrated and individualistic and collective cultures merge, new indicators of happiness will emerge. In order to increase happiness and well-being, and by taking on Schwartz's hedonism approach, firms with large employees should Im implement hedonism-based activities on a monthly basis. Firms will organise fun day outs on the last Friday of the month, whereby employees are able to engage in fun and pleasure-seeking activities, such as go-kart racing, movie trips and spa days. Not only will this contribute to work morale and motivation, which provides better results for firms, employees are able to maintain a fulfilling work-life balance and minimise levels of stress, Social media apps like Instagram and Facebook should implement well-being updates that notify users of the amount of time they're spending within the apps, as well as mental health advice and services. Doing so can allow users to feel less dependent on the apps and help establish healthy well-being practices, which as a whole can increase the happiness they receive. These services will be customised to incorporate cultural elements. Employers need to improve the hygiene factors in order to decrease job dissatisfaction and improve the motivator factors to improve job satisfaction and well-being. To achieve this, employers need to eliminate uncertainty over shift hours, making sure that employees' actual working hours are the same as the anticipated working hours. To do this, a workplace policy can be created that prohibits shift changes without 24 hours notice to the employee and guarantees no penalties will occur to the employee if he or she doesn't pick up anticipated shifts. This added certainty will improve employees' well-being. As cultures increasingly become integrated and lives become increasingly more complicated, the social media and societal trends, it is essential the youth of today are taught about well-being. Recommendation is for the government to include a well-being class, which is mandatory throughout New Zealand's intermediate and high schools. This class will firstly normalise the conversation around, around well-being, happiness, anxiety and depression, and secondly make the youth aware of such illnesses and provide information on where to go for help. According to the study above, well-being comes from social status and therefore industry leaders are likely to have overall higher well-being as they hold a higher social status. These poten this potentially means that they are in a better position to influence the behaviours of employees. How to do this would be by incentivising firms to, provide the, to improve the well-being of employees through medical cover or bereavement leave, as an example. From this, governments can reward firms through grants to invest in these areas or create an award system that helps a brand image. Building a brand image of this award gives an achievable target that businesses can strive for. This creates a mutual benefit as employees' well-being improves and the overall brand image is improved.
In conclusion, it's evident to us that cultural differences allow for both well-being and happiness to be interpreted in different ways, from hedonism and collectivist ideas, as well as ascription. We are able to analyze the full extent that culture plays within both happiness and well-being of individuals. Although happiness and well-being are two separate constructs, they both intermingle and often overlap each other, providing us with sufficient knowledge on how to elevate these dimensions on an individual and universal level.